My guests today are Greg Schlomer and Simeon Kakpovi. Gentlemen, how are you? Doing great. Thanks so much, David, for having us. Oh, thanks for coming. All right. I, now, we, um, I work with you guys. I actually just met you all last week at, uh, at a hackathon. And you were building something really cool for that had to do with cybersecurity. And you were working with students. T tell me about the cybersecurity application you're building. Yeah, thank you, David. Um, so we built a game called KC7. And what KC7 is, is a cybersecurity simulation game um, that essentially simulate what you would be doing in real life as a cyber defender. Someone who works in an incident responder, someone who works in threat intel, or someone who works in a SOC. Um, and, the reason we, and, and, and the reason we built it is because we saw there's a need out there for data, right? If you wanna learn how to do some of these jobs, you need to practice on realistic data. Otherwise, you know, you don't know what we're talking about. Um, and of course, no one's going to give that to you because you know, privacy, uh, secrecy, um, all this stuff. And so we figured, you know, what better way to fix it than by actually generating that data without any other legal concerns and p putting it in people's hands so that everyone has access to it. So it's fake data that looks like real world data and includes some benign information and some nefarious information, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, so basically we're, we're simulating the day-to-day -day operations of a fictitious company um, and then we're, we're modeling the sorts of things that employees do in that company. So if you think about what employees do, they send emails, um, they click on links in those emails. Uh, 90, just like in the real world, you know, 98, 99% of the links that they receive are, are legitimate, they're benign. Um, mm -hmm. But then we also model those malicious adversaries that send uh, malicious emails that have you know, credential harvesting links, uh, phishing links, and um, it's, it's the player's job to find that activity in the sea of uh, legitimacy. Oh, okay, what, what sorts of things are they looking for? What, uh, how would they know that uh, an email wasn't valid? That's a good question. The way we model it in this game at least right now, is that we start them off with a tipper, right? Which usually happens in real life. Someone will come up to you and say, hey, you know, I saw this domain. And we actually include, you know, a fake tweet inside of the training guide saying, hey, someone on Twitter said that this domain, you know, might be fishy or is suspicious or is malicious. And so you know that something is malicious because it is related to something else you know is malicious. And you have to assess what the degree of confidence of that relationship is. Right, so you know, if you have a malicious domain and you see that it's being sent in an email, in a particular email by a suspicious account, then that account might also be malicious because it's being used to send malicious data. Uh, yeah, it can be any number of things. So, you know, like Simeon said, starting off an investigation in the game, you know, typically it's it's very much like, oh, I heard from something or somewhere else that this domain is bad or this sender is bad. Okay. Um, and then as as the player goes through the process of the investigation, just like we would as as threat intel analysts in the real world, you know, you start picking up on trends. Um, so one thing we've modeled in the game is our malicious actors have certain keywords. So when they create an email account, it might have, for example, Viking themed words um, in the email address. So it's like norse at gmail.com. Um, and so as a player, you, know, you start with, here's this bad domain. Now I see this list of accounts that are sending the bad do domain to my company. And now I'm starting to pick up on these, these patterns. Like, oh, here's Viking at yahoo.com, norse at gmail.com, um, wooden ships at aol.com. 
Um, and so you can you know, start to compile this knowledge of the actor uh, using all these trends you identify and, and take that knowledge and apply it to the rest of the data sets to find um, those bad accounts. Okay, yeah, and then the, sometimes the content of the email can be a bad sign. Like for example, the, the text of the domain doesn't match the actual link that it domain to. It's, yeah. it's, it says Microsoft.com, but if you hover over it, it's actually, you know, bad Norseman. <laughs> yeah, and, and, that, and that's a really good point. That's something that we try to model uh, in our game, right? So right now we have the bones for, you know, how do you generate that benign and malicious activity? And so as we come up with more ideas for like, hey, we can do mismatch of like the text link um, and, and where it's actually going to, we can implement that in our data set saying, hey, uh, you can actually see that in the fields of our data. Um, so as we're coming up with more ideas, we have the ability to add these things uh, to the game without ne w without having to generate real life infrastructure, um, and so we're adding, you know, we're 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 adding and we're continuing to add new modules to simulate. Okay, okay, as an analyst, what do you need to learn? What kind of data sets do you need to learn? What concepts do you need to learn? How do we fit that um, into our data set so you can go and you can find that, find that, and make that link, uh, and say, hey, you know, I learned about. Uh, passive DNS pivoting in the textbook, what does that actually look like in real life? I can actually mm -hmm. go and run commands and run KQL um, and, and make those pivots. Uh, you mentioned KQL. Is that the mechanism mm -hmm. by which people <laughs> interact with this data or is there a separate user interface? Yeah, so there are, there's not a whole lot of other options, but there are a few other projects out there that, that do this sort of thing where it's like, you know, you have fake cybersecurity data um, you interact with it and you find things. But one of the things we really wanted to focus on with, with KC7 was giving players, giving students and you know professionals who pick up this game, the opportunity to use the actual tools that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, all the data interaction happens in Azure Data Explorer, um, which is the uh, sort of web interface for writing queries and dashboards using KQL, the Kusto query language. Um, so on our team, uh, Simeon and I use those exact tools every single day um, to, to track the actors that we track. And, you know, we wanted to make sure that experience was realistic for players so that they get not only like the foundational concepts of what is pivoting, you know, what is a domain, what is passive DNS, but also how do you actually use those tools to um, apply those concepts. And I understand you actually last week went to a couple of colleges and had students try this out. How'd that go? Yeah, I mean, and that was great. So we we're part of the uh, Microsoft Hackathon, and we got this global team of over 100 people who are passionate about cybersecurity um, and diversity outreach, right? Making cybersecurity a more diverse industry, you know, working together to kind of solve the problem. Um, and, and the game was one big component of, of that solution. So we thought, hey, you know, we can talk about this game, right? I can tell you how great the game is and, and what impact it would have or we can actually go out there and show people. And so we actually went out to two different schools. The first one we went to was Montgomery College, which is a community college in Maryland. Um, and then we also went to, uh, one of our teammates went out to Florida Memorial uh, University, which is the only historically black college in uh, South Florida. Hmm. And at Montgomery College, we had the students play this game and they were business students, right? So no experience in cybersecurity at all. All you knew was that you know, they were passionate, they were smart kids, um, but they didn't have any te technical chops. They didn't necessarily want to, want to go into information systems or cybersecurity or any of that. And we give them a short intro to Threat Intel and told them what we did, and then we had them play this game from scratch. No experience with KQL, no experience of passive DNS. They couldn't tell you what a domain is before we started. And we walked through them, we, we walked through the game with them, and, at, and you know, we took a halfway point break, like about an hour, hour and a half in with the kids. And this young lady comes up to us, and she says, how can I do this for a living? <laughs> like, I had so much fun that I would love to make this a career of mine. And we had that feedback from several students, um, which is really impactful for us, right? Because if we can even like change the mind of one person who didn't know about the field, who didn't know that it was accessible for them um, and make them think, hey, this is something that I would want to make a career and start going down that trajectory, I think that would make uh, a huge impact. Oh, that must have felt great that uh, 
getting feedback like that that you've, uh, you've impacted somebody's life. <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was super rewarding, super, super rewarding. Yeah. We've been, Simeon's actually been working on this project for, what, four years in oh, total? Wow. Yeah, almost almost four years. I started, you know, the, the rudimentary, this project came out from, from a need, a real need, right? It wasn't, you know, we're going to make technology and fit it to the need. It was really the other way around. I made it because a professor of mine, you know, was teaching a cybersecurity class, and he says, you know what would really help me convey these concepts and give students experience, I need this sort of thing, right? And so I built a static version of it, just a very tiny data set that I built manually. And I said, hey, here we go. And then he used it to teaching class. He had good feedback from, from his students. And he said, hey, can you like make it bigger? Can we add more features? Can we abstract it? Um, and so over the past four years, we've really just been like improving upon it and abstracting it. Um, and the difference between where it's at now with Greg and everyone else's help versus where it was then is that it's not just one and done, right? A lot of games, it's, you know, someone works on a game, you play it, and then you learn how the game works, you learn what the answers are, you put it down, you find the next game to play. We can generate a whole new game just by pressing a button, right? So whole new company, whole new adversaries, whole new TTPs. Um, so just a completely different experience. And the only way to truly be able to beat the game is by understanding in depth the cybersecurity concepts and by understanding how to use KQL, how to shape your, how to, how to make analytical questions and how to uh, answer them using data, right? Oh, and excellent. so that's a huge help to educators. And, and, I, and I think um, it will be a huge help to educators who don't always have the resources to do that. Very cool. You mentioned diversity. Where does diversity play into cybersecurity and this game in particular? Yeah, so that really was the, the driving force um, behind creating this. You know, cybersecurity is just a field that has a lot of barriers. Um, there's regulatory issues, legal issues, privacy concerns. Um, and so it's, it's just been a field that historically has only really been accessible to you know, certain groups of people. When we talk about students, it's like uh, students from specific universities that are recruited like in government jobs um, or universities that are recruited by companies that actually have cyber programs. Um, and so there's this, this issue of if you want to get into the field, you need the data. But if you don't have a job that has the data, you're never going to get the data. That's a um, vicious cycle. It is a vicious yeah. cycle. So, so we felt like you know, this really was one solution to that problem. And, and by giving more people the opportunity to explore the data, learn the skills, learn the tools, you know, we're, we're going to open cyber to people from more diverse backgrounds. Right. And I'll, I'll add on to that, that, you know, when I was starting out and, and, and I was trying to break into cyber, I had the same exact problem that Greg described, right? You know, I was at Howard University in HBCU. Didn't uh, necessarily the, the have... The bison, exactly, the best best university in the world. Um, <laughs> but you know, I didn't necessarily have like all the, the shiny tools I could use to get into the industry, um, and there weren't a lot of people like me uh, who were in the industry, right? Like I went to a, a competition. I did a competition uh, that was similar to this game, right? That Lockheed Martin ran. It was called the Cyber Analyst Challenge, um, and there were four pe black people in a room of a hundred. And that was me and my three coworkers at the time, right? And my theory is that the reason the industry is not diverse, right? And, and that, that continues till today. You know, in a lot of rooms, whenever I go to conferences, I, I will be one of a very few black people. And you know, you look around the room, there's not as many women, right? It's a, it's a pervasive issue. And I believe the issue is not that people of diverse backgrounds aren't skilled enough for the job. I think the issue is that they're not giving the opportunity to see what it's actually like, right? And I think when you give people to see uh, the opportunity to say like, hey, this is what you would be doing and this is how fun and how exciting it is and this is exactly how you can scale up if you enjoy that to get into those roles, you know, I think we would see a lot more people from untraditional backgrounds getting into this field. I totally understand that. I, I was at a, uh, a Latino user group not too long ago uh, for Latino coders. And I heard something really similar that he went to a, a, a neighborhood in Southwest Chicago, which was all Latino, 
and it didn't even occur to him this was a career because nobody talked to him about it. Nobody he didn't. exactly. He had no yeah. role model. I think it's, uh, there are other communities like that that are, uh, have similar issues, but they're just not aware that this is an option for them. Exactly, yeah, it's a huge thing. Um, it, now, this is uh, four years you've been working on this. Is this an ongoing thing? Or are you continuing to work on it? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're trying to, we're continuing to work on it, right? So this is just the beginning. Um, we're reaching out to, based on our contacts, reaching out to local universities, high schools, trying to get this in people's hands, trying to make this accessible to professors, right? If you're a professor and you want to teach, expose your students to exactly what cybersecurity analysts do, we want to make that data accessible to you through ADX. Uh, so right now we have a way for you to create an Azure free cluster. So Microsoft mm -hmm. offers free Custo clusters to any new user. Mm -hmm. um, so you get free Azure credits as well as a free Custo clusters. Just go to adx.com, I mean to uh, dataexplorer.azure.com. Um, we have instructions on our GitHub page that we can link uh, for, how you, for how you get there. Um, and you just have to run a simple script and you get the data all to yourself. Um, so you can use our training guide on top of that to teach your students, hey, from you know step zero, right? You don't know anything. Here's how you use Gusto, and here how, how that maps the data. So we're trying to get as much feedback from from students, from educators as possible, so we can figure out how to best deliver this content to them. What if people want to contribute to it and make the game better? Are you accepting? Is it open source? Are you accepting contributions? Yeah, it's hundred percent open source. Um, we think that's one of the things that really separates KC seven uh, from a lot of the other offerings out there is that it's totally free. It's open source. It's accessible to anyone who who is willing and able to um, to use it. And um, you know, Simeon and I are analysts. We're not software developers. Um, we're just really passionate about this cause, and we've sort of done our best to build it. Um, in its current state, but yeah, we're absolutely looking for people to contribute. You know, if you're a cybersecurity professional, um, you're a software engineer, and and you feel like this is a worthy cause, we would love to have your help, um, and we could certainly use your expertise. How do they get started doing that? So uh, yeah. Have, so, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Simeon. Yeah. So you know, we have set up some documentation on the uh, on on the GitHub code base for how you can fork the project. You know how you can see what the different modules are that we created. Um, so essentially, you can just make a pull request, uh, and then we'll review and potentially accept it. Or you can reach out to us directly, right? We're not, you know, we're not in a high tower. We can we're we're willing to to talk with folks and and, and discuss their great ideas and figure out how we can make that uh, con uh, add that to the game as as quickly as possible. We're we're moving quick and we're trying to to improve it uh, so that everyone can benefit from this. Okay, I'll put a link to the GitHub repository in the show notes of this, and then a way for them to contact you as well. Awesome. Awesome. And uh, you'll have, soon you'll have an email flooding in. <laughs> Love Sounds it. Sounds great. Look forward to it. Um, this is awesome. Uh, is there anything that we haven't covered you think that we should have? No, I mean, uh, so, so you know, people might be wondering, well, I guess some people might have figured out what the, where the name KC7 comes from. Good question. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So KC7 re refers to the last stage of the, uh, the Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain, you know, famous uh, model that we use in the cybersecurity uh, to try to determine or to try to envision how hackers, you know, compromise an organization starting from reconnaissance all the way to, you know, actions on, on objectives, right? So if, is the hackers tar targeting you, what they want to do in the first place? They want to ransom you or do they want to steal your data, right? Mm -hmm. That's, so KC7 is the final phase where the actor, you know, does whatever it is that they came to do. And so uh -huh. the idea is that by the time you finish playing this game or by the time you, you finish playing this game in its full form, you will have seen activity from an actor in all seven phases of the cyber kill chain, all the way from reconnaissance to, you know, actions on objectives. And, you know, as someone who's coming into the field, right, if you can go in, into an interview and you can talk about your experience pivoting through data, forming analytical questions, answering those questions across all seven phases of the cyber kill chain, I am willing to bet more often than not you will get whatever role that you're applying for. And so that's the point of this game is if you can play this game, you can work in cyber. Well, very cool. Uh, Greg, Simeon, I really appreciate the time. Uh, this is a fascinating project, and I hope that people watch this and 
both play the game and contribute to it. Absolutely. Awesome. Thanks so much Thank for the so time, much, David. David. We appreciate yeah. the opportunity. You guys stay safe. Thank you. You too. I like technology. And I like playing KC7 with my friends. <laughs>